It's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to the first Wallace Stegner Center and Natural Resources Law Forum uh, green bag of this uh, second or spring semester of 2016. Uh, I'm Bob Kiter. For those of you who don't know me, I've uh, had the privilege of directing the Wallace Stegner Center uh, here at the S.J. Quinney College of Law for the last 20-some uh, odd years. Uh, and this uh, green bag series has become a real staple of our programming. Uh, and we're pleased uh, to be able to uh, present uh, another uh, in our uh, long uh, line of uh, green bag uh, programs. Uh, I should note that uh, uh, the organization for uh, these programs would not be possible without the assistance of uh, our assistant director, associate director, Jan Nystrom, for the Stegner Center, uh, and uh, our administrative uh, assistant uh, and events uh, coordinator, uh, Aaron Reardon, uh, who are really responsible for making sure that uh, all of the logistics work, including, I should add, uh, our uh, technical team uh, that uh, is uh, enabling us to broadcast uh, over the internet uh, today's green bag and uh, other uh, green bag programs. And with that said, uh, I should welcome uh, our colleagues uh, at the uh, Quinney College of Natural Resources at Utah State University, who I understand are uh, tuned in uh, to uh, the presentation today. Uh, no surprise, uh, since the presenter is uh, one of their own. Uh, more about that in just a moment. Uh, a couple of very quick uh, announcements. Uh, one, uh, for those of you that came in early and that are looking for uh, continuing legal education credit uh, for today's program, uh, we got the CLE forms late on the table out front. If you need one, they're there now. Uh, secondly, uh, I did want to take this opportunity to note a couple of upcoming Stegner Center uh, events. Uh, first of all, we have our uh, annual uh, symposium, our 21st uh, annual symposium, uh, which is scheduled for March 31st, April 1st, on the subject of green infrastructure, resilient cities, new challenges, and new solutions. Uh, all tied into, as uh, you might expect, uh, the completion of this uh, extraordinary uh, green uh, new College of Law building that we fully expect will qualify for LEED Platinum certification once that process runs uh, its course. Uh, secondly, I, I wanted to note um, that we will, uh, the day before on uh, March 30th, uh, be hosting uh, Larry Suskind from MIT, uh, who will be delivering the annual Wallace Stegner lecture uh, uh, preceding the symposium uh, on the topic of managing climate risks in resilient cities. Uh, and then uh, one other program of note, on the 28th of this month, uh, as part of our uh, regular lecture series, we will be hosting Krista Scheidler, uh, who is a conservation photographer and writer of note, including credits with National Geographic, uh, who will be presenting her work uh, done over a lengthy period of time on the topic of continental divide, wildlife, people, and the border wall that is focusing on the impact of the border wall between the United States and Mexico on uh, both wildlife and people. With that said, let me uh, welcome uh, today and ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Jack Schmidt uh, from uh, the Watershed Sciences Division of the Quinney College of Natural Resources at Utah State University, where he is a professor of watershed sciences, also an expert uh, on uh, the Colorado River. Uh, among other things, he has studied and written uh, widely about restoring aspects of the pre-dam ecosystem, managing management strategies for the river's larger dams, uh, and the use of controlled floods as a management tool in Grand Canyon National Park. Uh, in addition to his uh, usual uh, professorial role, he has also served uh, on the ground as chief of the U.S. Geological Survey's Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center. Uh, his work there, uh, along with his scholarly work, has won him the National Park Service Director's Award for Natural Resource Research. Uh, in 2009, he also was a member of the Minute 319 Binational Partnership, which won the Department of the Interior 
Partners in Conservation Award in 2013 for planning and implementing a pulse flow release of the Colorado River into its former delta in uh, Mexico. Uh, so please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Jack Schmidt uh, to speak on the challenges that management of the Colorado River presents today. Jack. <laughs> thanks. Well, it's an honor to be here. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, everything I'm going to say today is just because I'm a college professor at Utah State University. Uh, I've been back at the university a little over a year. I did take leave for three and a half years and was uh, privileged to have a chance to work inside the federal government uh, leading the Grand Canyon Monitoring Research Center, but uh, nothing that I say has anything to do with representing anything that the federal government's doing. I'm just, I'm just a college professor with a few ideas. Is that okay, Rob? Did I say that right? <laughs> um, I'm mostly going to get on a roll and talk extemporaneously, but I just wrote a few notes uh, to get us started. Um, the Colorado River, of course, is a river of superlatives. It's one of the country's greatest natural resources and meets utilitarian needs for providing an abundant and essential water supply and needed hydroelectricity to 40 million people. The river is also superlative as a river of laws, an abundant array of international treaties and minutes, federal legislation, state legislation, and administrative rules and regulations that are collectively called the law of the river. The complexity of these laws and rules are one reason so many lawyers find a home in Colorado River policy and why so many lawyers rise to prominence in shaping the conversation about the future of the river. The river is also clearly a river of adventure, recreation, and literature. Few people travel through Grand Canyon for the first time without reading or being read to from John Wesley Powell's account of his 1869 first descent from Green River, Wyoming. Grand Canyon is certainly one of the United States superlative whitewater rafting experiences and many other canyons of the Colorado River are also among the country's greatest recreational river trips, regardless of whether or not we designate any of them wild and scenic in the state of Utah. The Colorado River and the Colorado Plateau in Utah are certainly a place that inspired Wallace Stegner. But the Colorado River is also a river of science and engineering. The story of the diversion of the Colorado River into the Salton Sink in 1904, the subsequent breaching of headgates, and the entire capture of the river's flow to create the Salton Sea, the struggle to return the river to its former course, was an engineering catastrophe and an engineering achievement that set in motion a long succession of public policy imperatives. Inevitably, the successful struggle to develop the Colorado River in the most southern part of the watershed established senior water rights in the far downstream end of the river that inspired the states in the northern part of the watershed to negotiate an interstate compact, the Colorado River Compact. The river is impounded by great dams. Lake Mead is the largest reservoir in the United States. Lake Powell is the second largest reservoir in the United States. The Colorado River has been a fertile region for the emergence of fundamental ideas in geology and geomorphology. Powell was able to broker what was really a river trip of survival and not really a scientific expedition 
um, into leading the U.S. <coughs> Geological Survey and making prominent and important statements about how the West should be developed. River science has also served engineering and development of the river. USGS expeditions in the 1910s and 1920s measured the plan and profile of the river, measured the discharge, measured the sediment <coughs> transport. We use those data even today, and those data set a tradition by which we could evaluate how much water we had to develop and what the sedimentation rates in the great reservoirs would be. We're at a crossroads today in planning the future of the river that I'm going to try to illustrate. And I think we struggle as a society concerning how to incorporate the tradition of science into the tradition of laws that govern our country. The premise of my talk today is that we do a good job and we're well positioned to meet the challenges of climate change, but our struggle is how we incorporate scientific insights into planning that future. What I'm going to do today is start large-scale, arm-waving overview of the basin. Then I'm going to descend into the weeds of Colorado River Grand Canyon issues and then try to step back and take a big look again. This is it. This is the uh, traction, isn't it? The river flows from the land of snow to the land of sun, and it's down in the land of sun that the primary uses of the river. Um, the river uh, carries uh, Colorado River snowmelt from the high runoff areas at the basin margins across the Colorado Plateau and the basin and range. One of the fundamental aspects of the interaction between the geography of water and the geography of how we use the water is that because there are so many senior uses at the far downstream end of the watershed, the real depletions in the river that give rise to a term like a river no more, a book published in the 1970s, really only applies in the far downstream end. There are large amounts of water that move at least all the way through uh, to Lake Mead. And so when I think about the Colorado River, I think about dividing the river into three parts unequal in size. Everything upstream of Lake Mead I call the upper river. Between Hoover Dam and Yuma, the transformed river and then the tiny little part, the delta, a very different place. <clears throat> now I know that many of you don't have the training in river science that I do, but I suspect some of you might be able to see the difference between this 1920s image and this exact replication of uh, that photo taken recently. We only deliver to Mexico 1.5 million acre feet of water, and then essentially 100% of that water is diverted to Mexicali Valley farm fields such that nothing goes further. A completely transformed place. The transformed river, Hoover Dam to Yuma, Half of its length has now been converted from river to reservoir. The rest has a highly altered hydrology that is successively depleted as one goes further downstream and the big canals to central Arizona and southern California deplete water out of the system. A very um, sort of artificial and challenged place to think about how to restore it. But in the upstream sections, upstream from Hoover Dam, one th the one thing we have is lots of water. 
The issue upstream of Hoover is the flow regime of the river. But we have water. The argument is how that water flow should be distributed throughout the year. We store water, so the magnitude of floods comparing pre-dam and post-dam conditions, the old floods are gone. We have occasional spikes that I'll talk about. The river goes up and down every day to produce hydroelectricity at needed times. We have higher base flows. And those large reservoirs trap the entire sediment load of the river. The Colorado River once delivered the second largest amount of fine sediment, sand and mud, to the sea of any river in North America, second only to the Missouri-Mississippi system. So that was a fundamental characteristic of the river, that now that sediment is trapped in the reservoirs. Dams affect downstream river channels differently depending on the degree to which the sediment supply is trapped in reservoirs and the degree to which we have flood control and smaller floods and a reduced capacity to move sediment and changes in the grain size of that sediment. The point is that the way rivers respond downstream, to downstream from each dam depends on this balance of how much sediment is trapped versus how much the flow regime has changed. It's not the same everywhere below every dam. And so we have dams at the exterior margins of the watershed that mostly trap water because that's where the water comes from, and dams inside the basin that trap the big sediment loads produced from the Colorado Plateau and the basin and range. And so the downstream segments of rivers below each dam have been tripped into sediment deficit or sediment surplus. Some places the problem is not enough sediment and erosion. Other places the problem is too much sediment and the filling of rivers by sediment. Here's a river that's filling with sediment, the San Rafael River, where all of its water is diverted for agriculture in Castle Valley here in Utah. The Pre-development hydrograph in blue has been completely transformed. There's virtually no water left in the lower San Rafael River, and the river has filled with sediment. That's one kind of problem. Whoops. Another kind of problem is too much, too little sediment, perhaps too much water for the available sediment supply. Here's a sandbar first photographed in the early 1970s in Marble Canyon, the upstream part of Grand Canyon National Park, and the shrinking and erosion and evacuation of sand out of that eddy. Okay? Two different problems in the river. Some places too little sediment, some places too much. So if we think about this, I'm trying to, I just want to close with this to sort of bring home the message. The problems that I'm going to talk about extensively in Grand Canyon aren't the only kind of issue we deal with in the Colorado River system. The problems in Grand Canyon are too little sediment. That's not the deal everywhere, but it is the deal that I'm going to auger into the weeds on for the next block of time. If you think about how, how we think about dams and their effects, well, anytime you just build a dam, there are certain inevitable impacts. The most inevitable is the complete trapping of the incoming sediment load. We do build dams, new dams, Three Gorges Dam in China, new dams in the Himalayas. Uh, do have sediment bypass and lower elevation flushing systems to move sediment through, but we didn't build any dams that way in the Colorado River system decades ago. At the other end, hydro peaking is entirely an operational decision that is made every day or every year or every decade. How, do we, how much electricity do we want to produce? So that's sort of an operational decision. And in between are the bigger issues of flow regime changes. And most of these big flow regime changes are related to managing the water supply. 
We often think in hydro peaking and hydroelectricity generation is a favorite whipping boy of sort of the activity that must be the reason why sandbars are eroding. And I'm going to submit that larger scale water supply issues are the bigger issue to, that we need to worry about. Well, we have developed the river for 40 million people and we're trying to desperately fix it and rehabilitate it in every part, in every way. And we don't do such a good job of talking to each other about what we're learning in each part of the river. I'm going to focus now on the $11 million a year effort to manage Glen Canyon Dam for the improvement of the 250 miles of river through Grand Canyon. We're spending as a society $11 million a year on the same 250 miles of river. You, I'm going to try to inform you about the role of science and then show you how policy boxes us in. And, uh, and then you can, but keep in mind this bigger context that we're trying to fix and rehabilitate a lot of places. So I'm just a geomorphologist. I uh, sort of learned the policy side and the legal side, uh, catch as catch can. Um, and so I'm not going to try to tell you your business in, in water law, but I'm going to try to make some comments about the interaction between policy and science. So one objective of river management in Grand Canyon is to rehabilitate the size of these eddy sandbars. Um, that is a management goal, and I'm going to try to talk about why in the world is restoration of these eddy sandbars so hard. It's just physics. So the size of these arrows is proportional to the pre-dam amounts of sand and mud that once passed through Grand Canyon on their way to the sea. Today, the Perea River and the Little Colorado River um, deliver about 14% of what once came through the river. All right? So that's the way it was. Um, now we have a dam. The dam completely blocks that upper arrow. That's gone. We could fix the problem by adding sediment back in. We know how much that costs. We at least have an order of magnitude uh, sense of what that costs. Uh, two to four hundred million dollars a year. You can think about whether you think that's a big number or a small number, but keep that in mind. So today what we're doing is the source, there's nothing coming in, and we're trying to manage what comes in from the Perea and the Little Colorado River. More fine sediment comes in from the Little Colorado River, but the majority of this sediment is mud, silt and clay, boppy, gooey, not great to put a campsite on, uh, but nevertheless, real sediment. But if you look at these numbers, about 35% more sand comes in from the Perea than comes in from the Little Colorado River. It's a smaller stream, but it brings in the sand. This is a photograph of Lee's Ferry and the confluence of the Perea with the clear water of the Colorado River. And um, because the Perea River delivers most of its sediment in the monsoon season of July, August, September, and early October, and because the Perea River is only 15 miles below the dam, the focus of managing the river is on the Perea because it's coming in at a defined time, way upstream. We have a potential to get some benefit for much of Grand Canyon downstream because it comes in so close to the dam. There's a long story about how the first flood 
got conceived and implemented in 1996. I was privileged to be one of the people who sort of thought this up. And it took us about five years behind the scenes, working as professors and federal employees to move the policy agenda and convince people that this was a good idea. Um, it was a great thing to be part of that. When we ran that, uh, when that flood occurred, a very obscure thing sort of was observed. The sediment at the base of the flood deposits was finer sand and it included lots of mud. And as you went up in those flood deposits, it became pure sand and coarser sand. If you look at the numbers, this is a classic graph. We've shown this a zillion times. In the solid line, the left graph, is the hydrograph. The flood was high and steady at 45,000 cubic feet per second for seven days. That's this. And all these dots in, in the field, in the middle of the field of that photo, are showing the concentration of sediment on different days at different places. And what you can see is all of those numbers decrease with time. The river ran out of sediment quickly. That said to us, oh, there wasn't much left to move by day four or five. That was a eureka moment. Well, lots of other science went on to try to anticipate and predict how long it took sediment to sort of come in from the Perea and move downstream. And the challenging answer was only a couple months and then it's gone. Well, that's a big challenge to water management when it turns out that you can't plan for five years when to have a flood. You, in fact, have to take advantage quickly of an opportunity. And so it challenged the engineering profession and the policy agenda to sort of come up with flexible plans to respond quickly to whatever nature gave us. And so I've got a cartoon here in which it just sort of shows a little bit of sand comes in from the Perea. It's in blocks and patches on the bed of the river. And if we don't do anything, that sand hops and skips and jumps and heads right on down to Lake Mead. But if we've got that accumulation of sand on the bed and we schedule a flood, we can suspend that sand in the water column and some of that gets caught in the eddies downstream, such that when that flood goes down, the eddy sandbars are bigger, the rest of that sand moves to Lake Mead. That's the idea of these controlled floods. And the challenge of science and engineering is how long and how high should the flood be, um, you know, the magnitude and duration of that flood. So this is what controlled floods look like in Grand Canyon, these little spikes. And in the background, I've calculated what the natural flood would have been had if Lake Powell were not there and did not exist. So these controlled floods are nothing remotely like the natural disturbance that nature would have given us. We store that water in Powell. Why are these floods such short little spikes? Because that's, the, the floods can't be any longer or you've run out of sediment and then you're in fact just eroding away the sand. So they can only be of a duration just enough to get the stuff stirred up, get it into the eddies and then drop the flow again. It's not a big ecological disturbance. We'll never have that again so long as all the sediment is trapped in Lake Powell. Does that make sense? That's the idea. Okay, so one of the great achievements of this administration was the negotiation and implementation 
of a flexible public policy protocol in which the states agreed with the federal government to say, we're going to measure and account for how much sediment comes in from the Perea River each monsoon season. We can't predict that. It's not like looking at the snowpack in the Wasatch and saying, we know it's going to be a big runoff year. I mean, we don't know what the rain patterns are going to be in southern uh, Utah each monsoon season. But we would account and measure how much sediment comes in, and then if enough sediment comes in, then in essentially late October and early November, we're going to take advantage of that and schedule a flood. And then we're going to start counting again in the spring. Spring floods are much rarer, but if one comes in, we'll schedule a flood. That is the single biggest change that this administration has accomplished in Grand Canyon, and it is a tremendous thing. And as somebody who worked behind the scenes on the politics as well as the science to get the 96 flood and these other ones across the finish line, to adapt, to have this as a protocol is an enormous achievement. <clears throat> what it requires is that very smart people measure and chase storms. Here's measuring the Perea River in flood, driving up from Flagstaff, measuring this, going to the bottom of Grand Canyon, measuring sediment transport, having innovative equipment that can continuously measure suspended sediment transport using acoustic sensors, uploading that to computers, being able to look at what those sediment delivery and transport has been, reducing those data efficiently and quickly, predicting how much sediment would be transported by floods using models developed by the USGS and others, working with reclamation to design what those floods would be. There's no other river in the United States, if not the world, that works this way. Floods, um, when they occur, create bigger sandbars. And I want to show these to you so that you also don't have a vision that we instantly recreate what was there when Powell went there. That's actually before and after one flood. It's a little bit higher. I suspect some of you aren't overwhelmed by that photo. Um, similarly in 2013. Uh, here's uh, another bar that uh, increased in size. Uh, I don't mean that that bar costs that much money, but that is the lost power revenue. Um, and then what's important in the story is that we build the flood, the bar, from here to here, but then the bar erodes by the next 11 months of regular operations, and then we build it up again, and then it erodes and we build it up again. Uh, full disclosure, this is the resource everybody cares about. We'll come back to sort of the policy side of this, but I just want to walk you through the science. But the good news is that these are long-term monitoring data, and uh, these are a collection of sites in Marble and Grand Canyon. And the good news is the long-term data show that we're building sandbars in Grand Canyon. That's the good news. What are the constraints? Well, the biggest constraint is that the Grand Canyon, guess what, is a prisoner of geography. But I want to think about it in a different way. I've got that big circle, water source. That's where all the Colorado River's water comes from. And I've got water users. I don't mean to offend the state of Utah or Colorado or New Mexico, but the high-end users are at the downstream end. It's almost like the shape of an hourglass. And in the middle, trapped in the middle, is Grand Canyon. All the water from the upper basin has to go through Grand Canyon on its way to the high-end users. And because of that, we can't manage Grand Canyon 
just to do the best job we could environmentally. We're trapped in a bigger water supply issue. We have to release an amount of water consistent with the Colorado River Compact and sharing the burden of delivering water to Mexico. And that fixes the amount of water that has to pass through Grand Canyon each year. <coughs> These are reclamation's estimates of how much water uh, uh, comes into Lake Powell every year, the long-term average, and, um, uh, and what you, I want you to see is that uh, what comes in by snowmelt. And what I want you to see is there are wet, wet episodes, multiple years that are wet, and multiple years that are dry. And if you look at the yellow graph, you can see there are never any droughts in Grand Canyon. There's a minimum amount of water that's going to go through. So we have some wet years where all the reservoirs are full. We never have dry years in Grand Canyon. From that perspective, ecologically, the problem is Grand Canyon hasn't had a good drought in 50 years. Um, I also want to show you that at the end, I've got something labeled equalization flows. Equalization flows are something I'm about to talk about is high releases at a time when it wasn't big water and there weren't full reservoirs upstream. And those equalization releases have their origin in a set of political and administrative agreements negotiated by the previous administration, but it was the right thing to do, uh, and agreed to in 2007, which basically says Lake Powell, the upper basin water, uh, reservoir, Lake Mead, the lower basin reservoir, are going to share the burden of how much water they have. We're not going to preferentially store water in Mead or Powell. We're going to keep the contents about the same. That way we keep the head and the two reservoirs about the same. Subsidized federal electricity goes to different places from Hoover and Mead. Southern Nevada uses the water out of Lake Mead. You can't have Lake Mead go dry. And we're going to sort of balance the contents. Um, in balancing the contents, these are predicted and anticipated reservoir levels in Powell and Mead. Lake Mead is a whole lot drier and a lot lower than Powell. That causes a lot of worry, and it has to do with something called a structural deficit, how much water is used by the lower basin, Mexico consumed in evaporation, evapotranspiration, transmission losses. That's a talk for another time. But there is a rule curve that establishes how much water is going to be released from Powell to Mead. And this is a present rule curve for the present. Depending on how much water comes in this year, this is how much water is going to be released out of Lake Powell through Grand Canyon. What I want you to see is the number is never less than 8.23 million acre feet. That's the minimum to fulfill the compact and water going to Mexico. But there are possibilities that the water releases would be even bigger than 8.23, even though that's not because Powell is spilling. Powell is a long ways from being full. But it's to keep Mead higher and to balance the amount of water we store in the two reservoirs. Does that make sense? So does that matter? Does that matter to sand management in Grand Canyon? Let's go back and look at the last 11 years of hydrology since 2004. We've had five controlled floods, some of them intentional, uh, some of them the result of the protocol, the high flow protocol of this administration, others long fought battles in the past, and then a period of equalization flows in the middle. There have been three characteristic ways that the dam has been operated 
in these 11 years. And I've shown them normal operations without controlled floods, normal operations with controlled floods, equalization flows higher than normal. And in this, uh, this uh, bar chart in the lower right, in the solid, in the deep blue bar is the median flow. You can think of that as like an average. It's 50% of the time the flows are higher than that, 50% lower. It's sort of the average flow. And then in the purple <coughs> is the more, the magnitude of the rare of a common flows. It's a 90% duration flow. And in the very top of the bar is the instantaneous, how high did the highest flow in any instant of time get? So the highest part, so these two black circles represent normal operations. The median flows aren't much different. The 90% aren't much different, but the peaks never get high. With controlled floods, the height of the blue bars and the purple bars are still about the same. It's normal operations, but we have these couple days of really high floods. And then the equalization flows, the average flows are a whole lot higher. That's the message, okay? Now, the other side of this is the Perea River doesn't deliver sand every year to the same amount. We have monsoon floods in some years, big monsoon seasons, other years nothing happens. So there have been big years and small years. And so when we have to think about what's going on in the river, we have to think about how the dam was being operated, having nothing to do with sediment in Grand Canyon, having only to do with the interim surplus agreements, having to do with large scale water transfer, and this other phenomenon, how much sediment was coming down the Perea. And so there are different scenarios. We've had normal operations in years when the Perea was delivering a lot of sediment, and normal operations when there were only small inputs. We've had controlled floods with moderate inputs from the Perea, and controlled floods with large inputs from the Perea. And we've had equalization <laughs> flows with large inputs of sediment, and equalization flows when nothing came in from the Perea. That's a lot of different possibilities. These, these are the last two graphs, so just or, uh, stay with me here. Okay, every one of these bars is, for a year, whether sand accumulated or evacuated out of, to the left, upper Marble Canyon, to the right, lower Marble Canyon, okay? If we managed sediment the best we could, the numbers would all be positive. They might just be a little bit more positive because we want them up in, the, uh, up in the bars, but we don't want them to be negative. Well, if we looked at the scenarios that gave us positive bars, <coughs> We get positive conditions when the Perea, nature gives us big floods. So that's, but that's, we don't need to congratulate ourselves. That's just, thank goodness we had a big monsoon season. Right, does that, you got that? Um, there has to, there are some patterns that have to do with sand move, being moved from the upstream 30 miles of Grand Canyon to the lower 30 miles and sometimes you don't get much benefit here, but it collects further downstream. But these are the winners, and in yellow, that's the color for big years of monsoons. <coughs> okay, but the negatives are bad. That's when we're mining and ex excavating a precious resource. That's what we don't want. And the message is equalization flows ream the canyon out, and that's bad. And the worst scenario is the scenario 
of this year when um, are these years when, in fact, equalization and big erosion in Grand Canyon occurred even though it was a big sediment year from the Perea. When equalization flows occur, you can't conserve sediment and you begin to mine away all the good you were doing. If we look at the, la the three years that the high flow protocol has been implemented, the good news is that we have positive numbers in Upper Marble Canyon, Lower Marble Canyon. We don't really understand what's going on in Eastern Grand Canyon, but there's a lot of accumulation. This is good, but it's really fundamentally because we've had three awesome flood years from the Perea River. The prior two years before the HFP protocol was implemented, we eroded sand out of all of Marble Canyon, all the way down to Phantom Ranch. And in fact, between five and six million tons of sand was delivered to Lake Mead, even though half that number was delivered. The difference between the two was the erosion of the resource we're trying to protect. That's bad. And so when you sum five years, and you don't just feel good about the last three years of the high flow protocol, you realize that the benefits of the high flow protocol are just making up for the large scale erosion that occurred by the equalization flows. Well, that's the issue with sand and it's hard, and that's because saving the sandbars of Grand Canyon isn't the only resource that society cares about. But I'm offering some caution here about whether we're really ever going to be able to do this job when every once in a while we're going to transfer large amounts of water from one reservoir to the other. So that's hard enough, and this is to meet this objective established by the stakeholders of the Glen Canyon Dam Adaptive Management Program. I could, you know, I trap students for weeks and go through these things. I could tell a similar story with managing humpback chub and trout. I could tell a similar convoluted story of how challenging it is for other resources. Suffice it to say that every one of these resources has its own complicated story. And even if it isn't as just the, con the complication between a physical resource and a biological resource, it's also a complication because some of the resources we want have nothing to do with the past river. An introduced recreational trout fishery, oh, the trout eat the endangered fish. Oh, we want to have everything. We want to have a natural river. And oh, we want to maximize hydropower production as well. There is a fundamental difficulty in sort of a potential feel-good sort of activity of, of trying to restore and protect everything. And that's because the Glen Canyon Dam Adaptive Management Program is made up of representatives of stakeholder-based resources that are potentially in conflict with one another. And so sometimes these programs end up with a feel-good effort to placate everybody with one resource, but in fact you can't fix everything. Well, that's just Grand Canyon. And I am aware of the time and we're, um, so this is now the swan song. That's just Grand Canyon. That's what $11 million a year on the same river gets you. A pretty tough battle. We could invest a whole lot of money on the San Rafael River, filled with sediment, probably shrunk by 75% of its former width, put water in. We could try to protect the Green River in canyon lands where water depletions and dam management have led to about a 10 to 20% reduction in channel width and in aquatic habitat. 
We could try to protect the delta. We could try to fix lots of things. And this was my back of the envelope calculation of how much sediment or flood regime is needed to fix lots of places, independent of whether a political consensus exists for any of these places. We are trying to do things. The pulse release from Morelo Stam is a wonderful, if tiny, effort to restore an ecosystem with a tremendous amount of political uh, fight to get to that. We're doing some simple things like reoperating Flaming Gorge Dam to better time pulse releases to the needs of the native fishery and spawning, in this case, Razorback Sucker. We've got some tough public policy decisions ahead. Whether to afford protection to the Yampa River in northwestern Colorado, the last big unregulated tributary left in the system. That means it's developable water. But it also means that the reason the Green River in Utah is so wild and has such a natural flow regime is because of this river. So the challenge ahead is that the Interior Department has projected that demand is going to go up in the basin by some unknown proportion. And global warming is going to decrease the amount of water. And this, of course, is this frequently shown plot in which the federal government took a courageous stand to acknowledge that there's not going to be enough water around. Other work, it predicts what degree of decrease in runoff we might have. The implications of all this for public policy is that how much of the law of the river is inevitably going to have to be renegotiated. When that renegotiation goes on, I'm just arguing that river science, among the best in the United States, needs to be at the table. My illustration of the negotiation of the interim guidelines is that the best river science wasn't at the table. And therefore, an agreement to have equalization flows independent of the sediment conditions in Grand Canyon potentially negates any good we're doing in the high flow protocol. We can't go down that road again. I'd submit, this is sort of Jack's off the cuff, what would you do in different places? You can disagree, but the point is, we need to be thinking about the whole watershed. Commenters in the field of river restoration all say we need a guiding vision for the river you're trying to restore. We need to move from a guiding vision for Grand Canyon, which we don't even have. That's all those mutually incompatible desired future conditions. We can't figure that out. Why? Because it's an immensely challenging thing with so many stakeholders. But we need to do that for every part of the river and then put it all together because the hydro system is linked. The hydro, the, the power system is linked. Trade-offs of what, caught, what you lose and gain at one dam and another dam are all linked. But we don't have an environmental vision. And then we need a river science community, whether it's a federal agency that directly advises reclamation or whether it's an independent, freestanding academic institution. We need a public policy institute for the Colorado River. We need a Colorado Storage Project Science Center so that science and environmental values and ecological and environmental security are at the table when these big water supply agreements are um, negotiated. So bottom line, think about the Colorado River in three parts. Too little sediment, too much sediment, depends on where you're at. Um, it's not just hydro peaking is the enemy. We have to challenge ourselves to how to meet water supply agreements at the same time that we manage the river. Grand Canyon, we're probably doing the best we can 
But given these large water supply agreements, we may be fundamentally doomed. Or not. That's that. No, no, I got to be careful here. Uh, no, no, I, I'm, I'm being serious. It's a tough road, okay? It's a tough road. Um, there are other parts of the system we could fix, and the imminent future supply, water supply crisis is an opportunity to change the way we're doing business, to move the environment and river science to the table. Thanks. There's a whole bunch of students, and uh, well, first up, your thanks for humoring me and staying. Uh, I know that all the students need to leave quickly. Please feel free. Um, I apologize for running over. I'll take whatever questions, but anybody who needs to leave should feel completely free to leave. Yeah. What's the magnitude of water that goes through in the high flow protocol versus the equalization flow, and could those be? Um, is it an issue of timing, and could they be more made more compatible? Right. So, um, and, and the, the problem is it's sitting in this room. Some people don't know much about the Colorado River, and then there are some other experts, so I've had to be careful about how I talk about this. Um, the base is 8.23 million acre feet. The first little tier up is about 9.5. I think it's a number like that. And then you go up into the tens and 11 million acre feet. But a fundamental aspect you know, of the science of sediment transport is that a little bit more water in a river in flood moves a whole lot more sediment. It's a nonlinear relationship. So adding more water moves a whole lot more sediment. So what I would advocate and what, what I think is I mean, so long as Glen Canyon Dam is there, you really have, I mean, you're sort of constrained. The best thing we could do in the near term is to not try to have a system, have a rule which basically says, oh, they're out of balance, we got to move water immediately downstream without asking, is the ecosystem in Grand Canyon capable of handling that? And we could at least say, you have two years or three years to make up that balance, so at least you can move the sediment down at the most favorable time. It's still going to be bad. But what's happened in the new EIS that Interior has now released in draft form is that we know the best ways to conserve sediment in good years but we have a set of alternatives which say this is how much water will be released in any month or in any season that are still independent of sediment and resource conditions in Grand Canyon. We need to make them conditioned, we need to make releases in Glen Canyon Dam condition, uh, uh, conditional on the state of the resources. So the best you can do in the near term is try to hold the water back until you've got favorable sediment conditions. The other thing then is to consider bigger, more innovative kinds of floods. That's a very, that's the next level of discussion and that's a really tough argument. That's the best you can do right now. Yeah. Can you give us a quick take home message from the biologists in terms of how the high discharge flows or pulses yeah. Help the uh, humpback chub and the other fish in terms of the nurseries or what have you. <coughs> I'm just trying to decide how frank to be. Um, <laughs> um, okay. Um, this year was the worst case. It was a unique time, and this um, we had another really good year this fall coming from the Purdue River and no flood occurred. Why? Because we have yet another non-native exotic competing and predatory species that's shown up in the Grand Canyon ecosystem, green sunfish. And they weren't eradicated. And the possibility that floods would spread yet another non-native species was enough to call it off. So there, 
fish management trumped sediment. Um, uh, there's no real indication that high floods spread trout further downstream from floods. That's really good. So floods do not move the trout to places we don't want them. So that's the other good news. The chub, you know, it's just a flood. It's a pretty wimpy flood. It doesn't matter. They do their things. They could care less. The, um, there's no real habitat benefits. So it's more that floods might advantage non-native species and we didn't do it for the green sunfish and for the trout it seems to be a, a it doesn't matter. Yeah? Will uh, Mead and Powell ever fill up the sediment and if so, is there a plan? Um, it's hundreds of years. Um, uh, Powell will fill up with sediment at a time in the future that is further away than the signing of the Declaration of Independence is in the past. Um, there's no plan. I'm not sure we know what this North America will look like or who will control it in a couple hundred years. Uh, so the answer is we don't have a plan. It's viewed as many hundreds of years away. Yeah. Can you talk about the importance of best management practices and innovation efforts such as the controlled flooding? Um, in, however, in your opinion, would it be beneficial to remove Glen Canyon Dam for long-term ecological health and cost effectiveness? Well, the way you ask the question, <coughs> um, I think I would say the answer is an easy yes. Because you ask the question for the ecological and environmental benefit of the Grand Canyon. Well, then that's an easy yes. But if there's anything that I've learned, you know, we're a democracy, thank goodness. We don't build dams on the Yangtze River and the Three Gorges and thus tell a couple million people that they're leaving or they're going to be swimming. Uh, we at least get to debate it. And no matter how frustrating the stakeholder process is, Thank goodness we have that. And there is not societal consensus to remove the second largest reservoir in the United States. Um, now, and it's hard to imagine we're going to be removing storage in a brave new world, and we don't know what climate change is going to throw at us. That said, it is not inconceivable to consider completely renegotiating how much the relative storage contents and the objective of the storage contents of Powell and Mead. And that we could easily think about not thinking that, well, Powell is our reservoir, it's the Upper Basin's reservoir. Mead is their reservoir. We don't want to give us, them our water. We would be better off if we just thought about what is the best place to store water? Where would we lose the least water in evaporation and bank storage? And the, the problem with the Phil Mead first proposal is that you still can't have a flood any bigger than the capacity of water to move through the existing turbines and the existing bypass tubes. If we had all the money on the planet, you would reopen diversion tunnels so you could have big floods going out of, through Glen Canyon Dam, even when the reservoir was relatively empty, and store all your water in need. That said, there are enormous ecological ramifications of doing that that might put the humpback chub in jeopardy. It's a very complicated issue, but um, it is reasonable to ask. And it is reasonable to ask where the best place is to store water. It's not smart public policy to just say that's an issue we don't talk about. Yeah, uh, with the uh, increased demand, uh, shrinking supply,
supplies that um, the changing climate suggests. Um, you indicated that it might uh, uh, put some onus on a readjustment or relooking at the Colorado River Compact. In that, in that way, what would be, from your scientific perspective, uh, would be sort of an optimal Um, not, 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 I'm just a professor, yeah, but I am an employee of the state of Utah, and so I, I hope no one with the state of Utah tries to get me fired. Um, you know, the geography of water use in the Colorado River gives us hope. And the reason it gives us hope is we have so many big users at the downstream end. That gives us tremendous flexibility. Think of the Rio Grande. All the water comes out of the San Juan Mountains and the, and, the, and the Rockies, and a huge amount of it gets immediately thrown onto bean fields and alfalfa fields in the San Luis Valley. And the rest of it gets consumed in central New Mexico. The dead last of it gets consumed by El Paso and Juarez, and zip gets any further. That's because the big users are in the upstream. Then. So the best thing for the fish, I mean, I, I flippantly say that one of the purposes of my, when I teach about this stuff at Utah State, I sort of help people see that the best friend that the endangered fish in the environments of the upper Colorado River Basin ever had is Los Angeles and the Imperial Valley. Because they're the ones who are making sure that water stays in all the way downstream. And so I do think that um, we can't keep developing new, put new straws into the Colorado River. That makes no sense. We don't have enough to go around. We've got a structural deficit in Lake Mead in the lower basin. So that would be the first thing. I'm not going to suppose how the compact should be renegotiated. It's certainly true the states are going to do everything they can to find flexibility in the compact without renegotiating. Um, I feel strongly that when in all of those negotiations, there needs to be a river science advisor along with the attorneys and the political power people saying, hold it, you can't do that, or here's a ramification. If you go down that road with your eyes wide open, knowing there are adverse impacts to the environment, that's fine. We can't, we can't, we can't fix everything. But we're not treating what the best river science <coughs> with respect, and we don't even we sort of tell Grand Canyon, well, come up with the best you can, but we're not changing any of these big rules. That doesn't work. Yes, sir. Jack, could you talk about the importance of being able to explain science to policymaker types and then the importance of the policymaker types being able to understand that and factor that into the decision? Rob Smith is a solicitor for the Department of the Interior. Um, um, I, I, okay, this is going to sound um, this is this is going to sound self-promotional, but I'm just going to tell you what my take is. Um, I was motivated to leave Utah State and go and go take this position in Flagstaff for several years because I was really dismayed by where things stood. I've been one of the people that sort of work behind the scenes to get this act passed, the Grand Canyon Protection Act stuff. It meant a lot to me. I'd go up to stakeholders and say, well, what are you working on? They say, oh, we don't know. It's really complicated. Well, we don't know why we go to these meetings. And I felt like the place was just a drift. And it was just like, well, it's really complicated. <laughs> and everything I tried to do in three and a half years was to be the explainer in chief. And to try to take what seemed things that seemed complicated and to make them simple, and say these are the simple policy questions we have to deal with. And I, I this administration has done courageous things. They sure as hell didn't need me to be part of the deal, but I was lucky enough to be swept along and be part of that. And it helps for scientists to communicate clearly, to make uncertainties and ambiguities clear, to make risk clear, but to not have it seem so hopelessly complicated that people just throw up their hands and say, well, then we're not going to worry about science. It's too complicated. 
We're just going to do the laws because we know those. And so it's hugely important to make those, to make that, um, to communicate from scientists to policymakers. Policymakers have to be really clear to scientists. We need to know these kind of answers from you. Can you give us this? Scientists need to say, we can't give you that, but we can give you this. Policy people often want to say, um, can you give us this nuanced answer? Scientists need to have the courage in the backbone to say, that's a trivial scientific question that's so far in the weeds, there's no way to answer it. There needs to be a strenuous communication back and forth so that the policy side stays focused on the big things. The high flow protocol is a big thing. And then uh, communicate better. It's hugely important. Because otherwise you go off into the weeds of scientific minutiae and then you lose the interaction. Is that? Yeah. Uh, please join me in thanking Jack for this.